Virtual Vice President, Mr. Virtual Chief Justice, virtual members of the United States Congress, distinguished guests, and of course, my fellow Americans. You know, it seems a tradition, and it's actually kind of a noble one, to begin a president's vision for the future with a quote from a great American philosopher, and I wish to do exactly that. Because when he was asked about the state of America, comedian Louis C.K. replied, everything is amazing and nobody's happy. Everything is amazing and nobody's happy. Feels kind of right, doesn't it? Because on one hand, we have technological marvels like smartphones and iPads. We have huge flat screen HD TVs and hundreds of channels of entertainment. We have rapid and astonishingly safe air travel to any point on the globe at very reasonable prices. We have miraculous advances in medicine that add both length and quality to our lives. We have an unmatched military without the looming threat of enemy fleets or tens of thousands of nuclear missiles aimed at our cities. And everything is amazing and no one is happy. We're not happy because for the first time in our history, we're not allowed to be happy. Mostly, not exclusively, but mostly. We're not happy because of what goes on in this magnificent white building behind me here and the other one out on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Politics has invaded everything. And my friends, politics sucks. We're not happy because everyone knows that the giant mushroom cloud of debt that hangs over this country will eventually destroy our economy and the world's economy. A government that cannot pass a budget, cannot keep to a budget, cannot stop spending, and which borrows almost half of the money it does spend is irresponsible, it's incompetent, and it's reckless. We are not a nation of addicts. We're not a nation of addicts, but we're a nation run by addicts. We're not happy because we're told time and time again by the people here in Washington that we're not entitled to individual happiness. We're not happy because more and more every day, this magnificent experiment in the power of the individual is being remade yet again into another giant, collectivist, faceless, mindless, soulless state where the people of both parties, inside these buildings and in the bureaucracies that ring this beautiful capital, tell the rest of you of both parties what to do and how to live. You know, the Constitution is the how of America, but it's the Declaration of Independence that's the why. When Thomas Jefferson came back with his draft of the Declaration, I know his most famous sentence must have shocked and surprised his readers. I'll bet it shocked and surprised him, frankly, when he wrote it. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Wait a minute, because up until that moment, the enlightenment, that revolution in thinking that saw men and women not as subjects or as masses, but as individuals, as individual people with rights granted to them at birth, not as groups or as tribes or as classes, but equally as individuals. Well, up until that very moment that Jefferson wrote that line, when people talked about the unalienable rights of individuals, they referred to life, liberty, and property. Private property, any property, no matter how small, from a, from a skyscraper to a hoodie, is no more or no less than what separates each individual one of us from the king, or the sultan, or the emperor, or the czar. The people who used to own everything, they used to own all of it. But Jefferson dropped property. He went someplace that no one, certainly that no government, had ever gone before. Jefferson understood that no government was worthy of the consent of the governed unless its people its individual people had at least a chance to pursue their own personal happiness. The Enlightenment invented the idea of the individual person protected by inviolate rights as the only way to pursue real happiness. And real happiness is your happiness. It's not someone else's, it's your happiness. Our founders understood that there were three things that we needed as a society in order to pursue our own unique happiness. Now, the first thing that we need in order to be happy is freedom. Thanks to the hundreds of thousands of men, and now proudly women too, who've given their lives for this country, 
The shameful fact is that we've been so free for so long that we've utterly forgotten what tyranny looks like. Very few of us know enough about the histories of the hundred million people killed by treating people not as individuals, but as collectives. To be able to recognize those signs of how those mass murders began, things like the dividing of a nation into tribes with class divisions or racial divisions or religious divisions, all with the same purpose, to demonize an enemy and put a face on our collective envy. History shows us that societies that value collectives over individuals end up murdering millions of their own people. Societies that value individuals over collectives don't. You know, we've been free for so long that we think of our freedoms as something written on with a quill pen on a faded piece of parchment safely behind glass locked in a fortress just down the street there. We're not happy because we're not free. And we're not losing our freedoms because of tanks in the streets. We're losing it because of the thousands and thousands and thousands of new laws and regulations that are passed every single year by the people in these buildings here in Washington and in other state capitals. I know for an absolute moral certainty that every American within the sound of my voice right now is in violation of several, if not tens, or even scores of laws and regulations they know nothing about. <laughs> If everyone is breaking some law or another all the time, well, then we no longer have the rule of law. We have arbitrary enforcement, and this keeps us in a state of low-grade fear, and fearful people are not happy people. Now, some reasonable rules and regulations, of course, are important, and in fact, they're essential, but we will not be happy until we put this out of control, ridiculously invasive, and utterly insane regulation-generating train wreck back on its rails. To do that, we need to remove from the building behind me the people of both parties who do not understand the limits on government and replace them with people of both parties who actually do. More and more and more little laws get made for the little people while the big people ignore with impunity the big laws. And when I say big laws, I mean laws like the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, and that has got to stop, and it's got to stop now. Now, the second thing we need in order to be happy is some prosperity, but we're not allowed to be prosperous anymore, because if you or your household made more than $380,354 in 2010, then you're one of the evil one percenters. Now, of course, if you only made $380,000 $353 or less, then you're all right, you're a good person, you're one of the 99%. If wealth is limited, if you can't make more of it, then let's just admit it, the collectivists are right. If you can't make more of it, then wealth can only be redistributed. A businessman with a $20 million jet is evil because he took more than his fair share out of a limited pot of money. His $20 million jet meant that some student get to, didn't get to go to college or some mom had to go on food stamps, but, but, if wealth can, in fact, be created right out of thin air, then that businessman is not a villain, he's a hero. Because the $20 million he has for his jet is just a small percentage of the total amount of wealth that he's generated for the rest of society, so which one is it? Can wealth be generated out of thin air? Well, of course it can. Of course it can. You can take a dollar pen and a dollar legal pad and write a screenplay and sell it for a million dollars and people will work a little harder than they need to just to survive so that they have an entertainment budget to go and see the movie. Every time you create something, every time you write a poem or a song or you drop a blueprint for a building that wasn't there or a business plan for a dry cleaning store that wasn't there, every time you create something of value, which means something other people want, you actually generate real wealth. But the real way to generate wealth, and a lot of it, is through trade. Now, today's economy is so complex, so let's just make it simple. Let's go back to prehistoric times. Let's say that there's a hunter tribe up there in the mountains. Now, since they hunt, they have terrific spears. They're strong, and they're flexible and light, and they have razor-sharp stone spearheads, and they fly straight and true. But they don't gather much, so their baskets kind of look like bird's nests. Now, down on the seashore is a gatherer tribe. They try to spearfish occasionally, but their spears are just wobbly sticks that break half the time, but they do a lot of gathering. 
So they know how to weave baskets so tight that they'll actually hold water. Now, one day, a guy from the hunter tribe meets a guy from the gatherer tribe in the Midlands, and he says basically in his primitive caveman way, sir, I think that is the most magnificent basket I have ever seen. And the gatherer says, well, allow me to retort. That is one absolutely awesome spear. So, the hunter trades his top-notch spear for the gatherer's awesome basket, and they both turn around and they go back home. Now the question is, which one of them goes home richer? They both do. They both do. That's the miracle. They both go home wealthier because they have something of value that they didn't have before. So the hunter guy goes back up to his cave and everybody in the tribe oohs and ahs at the amazing basket and people offer him the little shiny pebbles that they use for money, but he doesn't sell it. Instead, he lies awake thinking, you know, I usually go through a spear a week. I'll bet you, I'll bet you, if I got up an hour earlier every day and stayed up a couple hours later, I bet you I could make an extra spear this week, maybe two. And then he realizes that his daughter's not going to starve to death after all because his idiot son-in-law can help make the spears and he can supervise. <laughs> so this proto-genius then takes all of the extra spears and trades them for the extra baskets that the other hard-working gatherer genius has created. The new wealth is generated by the extra work that people do in order to get the extra reward. So, who loses here? Who loses? No one loses. The hunters get baskets the likes of which they never could have had before, and likewise, the gatherers suddenly find themselves with spears they simply could not make. Pretty soon, everyone has an awesome spear and an amazing basket. Now, it is true that the men and women actually making or trading spears or baskets have more pebbles or seashells than those that don't, but they didn't take those things by force. Those people willingly gave them their money because better baskets and better spears improved the quality of their lives immeasurably. They made them happy. So when the people behind us make more and more rules to make it harder and harder to trade spears for baskets, or maybe to allow two hippies named Steve to make a personal computer in their garage with an Apple for a logo because IBM wasn't interested. Well, every time the government gets in the way, it makes us all poorer because the government doesn't make anything. It only makes it harder for other people to make things. And if we want to be happy, it should be as easy as possible for us to make spears or buy baskets or make iPhones or sell apps for those iPhones. And you work hard doing those things. That's why they pay you. When all the income taxes and sales taxes and social security taxes and luxury taxes and estate taxes and gas taxes and utility taxes and property taxes and capital gains taxes and all the rest end up taking about half of your money, what they're really doing is taking about half of your happiness. The government should only do those very few things that only a government can do because you know how to spend your own money better than these people do. You did build it. You did. You did build it. You did work there. You did make those. You did, not them, you. That's your money. It's not theirs. The final thing we need to be happy is virtue. Now, some people think that virtue means not having sex until you're 70. But it doesn't mean that at all. Being virtuous just means doing the right thing when you're supposed to. Honestly, honestly, my fellow Americans, being virtuous really just means don't be a jerk. It's just that simple. Don't cut in line. Don't cheat on tests. Live up to your obligations. Pay your bills. Don't hurt anyone. Don't take anyone else's stuff. And do what you promised to do. It's really just that simple. Now, our happiness depends on virtue because virtuous people don't need endless rules and regulations. Virtuous people can govern themselves. People who cheat, people who steal or hurt other people, people who lack virtue, not only cannot govern themselves, they don't deserve to. They don't deserve freedom or the prosperity that comes from hard work. We cannot keep 
punishing the innocent for what the guilty do in this society and our nation. We can all be a lot happier as a society if we all just mind our own business, pursue our own unique individual happiness. Louis C.K. was right, but it's actually easy to make him only half right. Everything is amazing and we can all be happy if we put, if we put this invasive, collectivist, ever-growing monstrosity of a state back into the beautiful, competent, frugal, well-ordered, fiscally responsible, government-sized box that it originally came in. And finally, there's the ultimate collectivist lie that makes so many of us not only unhappy, but also full of lifelong frustration and rage and despair. And it has to be refuted at every turn. And that lie is that handouts are a source of strength rather than weakness, that things given to you for free are better than the things you have to work for. Well, here's a thought for you. There's only one kind of animal on the entire planet that does not have to spend every single day of its life working for its food. On the entire Earth, from microbes all the way up to blue whales, only one kind of animal has all of its needs provided for by others. And that one kind of animal is a captive animal. <laughs> captive lions don't have to hunt. They spend their entire lives sitting in a cage. Bears will sit in a park and eat human garbage instead of swimming in a stream eating salmon because even though eating garbage is worse than eating salmon, it's far worse. It's also easier to eat garbage than it is to go catch salmon. But a lion in a cage is not really a lion. There's something missing from his lies. We've utterly failed as a people. We have utterly, utterly failed. Millions and millions and millions of precious, irreplaceable, magnificent human beings by keeping them captive behind the loving and caring bars of government handouts. This is the challenge of our age. This is the real challenge. To teach captive lions to leap and to roar, to teach bears, actually to reteach bears what it's like to walk away from garbage and eat the best food on the face of the earth. Because a free bear is a happy bear, and free people are happy people. Amen. It's going to be very hard for us to reteach that message. And we're not going to throw anybody out on the street in order to do it either. We're going to have to reintroduce ourselves to living free. And that's going to be hard at first, but not for long, because salmon is delicious <laughs> and garbage isn't. Each of us, one by one, can voluntarily, voluntarily find a way to do our individual part for some other individual. That's our choice, that's our challenge, and it's our gift. It's our privilege to set people free. And we're going to do it, too. You just watch. Thank you very much. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.